thousands of dollars from a machine gun range. Chris June Kiliani voted time and again to give herself a pay raise at taxpayer expense. From the issues that impact your lives to the future of our state, tonight, the top two Nevada Democratic governor candidates face off in a live debate. Well, good evening and welcome to the 13 Action News and Nevada Independent Democratic Debate for Governor. I'm Todd Quinones. And I'm John Ralston, the editor of the Nevada Independent. All right, well, over the next hour, no questions are off limits as we dive into the issues that impact you, the voters out there. Now, this will be an open debate. We're going to encourage the candidates to engage one another. So let's right now introduce those candidates. Well, they are Clark County Commissioners Chris June Kiliani and Steve Sislak. Thank you both for being with us here tonight. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. All right, so let's get started right away. And uh, Commissioner June Kiliani, you're gonna get the first question. And uh, obviously, I always like to say elections are about choices and you're trying to contrast yourself uh, with your opponent. I think people might be wondering, why are you more qualified to hold the most important job in this state than the man standing next to you? Because I'm a special ed middle school teacher and it prepared me to do everything that I have to do in my life. And more importantly, I'm the only one running Democrat or Republican statewide that actually has experience both legislatively as well as at the local level. I did serve 16 years as a public servant for in uh, Nevada Assembly. and. I, I wanted to make sure that I looked at budgets. I looked at making sh sure how the governor put the, puts everything together. I was known as a budget hawk during that period of time. But more importantly, it's about taking time to go out and listen to people. So I've been going around the state. When I was president of the union in 87 and 91, I actually drove, I lived in northern Nevada and drove my motor home for, uh, for four years. That taught me about how people live, where they live. You actually have to show up in order to be able to represent them. And recently I did another tour around the rural counties. I've been going out and doing listening tours in order to make sure that people know that I'm reacquainting with them. It makes me the best qualified in the long run. But it's an executive position, and uh, Commissioner Sisolak, uh, in a previous life, was the CEO of a company. He's had executive experience. You've been in the public sector your entire life. Doesn't Isn't that an advantage he has over you? No, I don't really think so. I think being in a classroom, you have to learn how to organize, how to manage, how to talk with people, all of those pieces. But you have to know how people legislate. I work very closely with the gubernatorial uh, governors that I serve with, both Democrat and Republican, in order to make sure that we, we knew how Nevada Function. I bring that executive experience. With no disrespect, Mr. Sisolak has not been a, a business person for 20 some plus years. And that executive degree, we're both the same on the, on the county commission. We actually both serve, we do the budgets together. Um, I, I, I believe that I am the most qualified in Nevada because of not just my teaching and my educational experience, but also because of my legislative and my local experience. Commissioner Sisolak, why are you more, the most qualified candidate? Because I'm the kind of person that gets things done, I just don't talk about getting things done. I've been elected as chair to the county commission three times by my colleagues because they have confidence in my ability to get things done. Part of being a progressive, the root word, is progress. You have to move forward. You have to make progress and get things done. I've done that during my entire tenure on the county commission. I, done, I did that when I was on the Board of Regents. We got things done. We fixed the uh, funding formula between northern inequities between northern and southern Nevada. We made progress on different issues. And I get to yes. My goal on the county commission is to get to yes. You, know, you work with my colleagues in order to be able to get to where we need to get to so that we can get a common agreement and we can get to yes and get things done. Just having a protest vote doesn't accomplish anything. But I guess what I would ask is, and, and, and Commissioner June Kiliani mm -hmm. brought this up, she knows state government in and out. She was there for a long right. time as a legislator. She understands the budget. She was on the Ways and Means Committee. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. She'll, the argument could be made that she'll get there ready to go right away. It would be a steep learning curve for you. I pride myself in being a pretty quick study. I'm capable of getting up to speed very, very quickly. You're right. She has been there for 18 years. She was, been, was there for 16. 18 years, whatever it might have been. We are still, after the end of that 16, 18 year tenure, worse than education, our infrastructure is crumbling, our mental health system isn't working, is broken, healthcare is not any better than it was before. She had 16, 18 years to fix this. I think it's time for a breath of fresh air and somebody new that can approach pro the problems from a different perspective. John, oh. may I interact act here? Um, you know, as the most progressive candidate in this entire race, I was progressive before it was really a word. Um, if, if you go back to my, my working during the, the legislative time, I worked across the aisles. I got more bills passed 
under a Democratic and Republican governor and a Republican-controlled Senate. And the way I did that was problem solving. You sit down and you learn to listen to people. You bring them together and you work things through. That's how I passed ca uh, universal kindergarten. That's how I got oral contraceptives covered for women in the 90s. That's how I actually got solar legislation passed, defelonizing of, of, of um, marijuana and making sure that our, we restored our rights of our ex-felons. Those are progressive stances before they were politically popular that I worked through. And I did that by working across the aisles. I remember still serving with Senator Raggio, um, and as you well know, on my, my, the kindergarten bill, and he finally sent me a note said I'm going to hold my nose and vote for it. I had to negotiate with, Sen with current Governor Brian Sandoval on how to bring that to closure. You do that by you listening to each other, by respecting each other's differences, but you get things done. And I, I got so much done for the state of Nevada, not for myself personally, but for individuals. If you want to talk about budgets, you remember some of the days where we had special sessions on a regular basis. In 2003, I think we had three of them, all over education funding. And we made sure that we funded class size reduction. We funded class um, kindergarten. I put that together as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, and we got it done. Unfortunately, for the last 11 years, they've declined again. And Governor Sandoval's done a good job. He's tried to bring some funding in. The Democrats have as well. But they have not been able to, to really fill the final budget hole, which is the funding formula. Our kids, our, our per pupil is one of the lowest in the United States. It's unexcusable to me. So that's why I'm the education governor. I know how to fund education. I know how to get it done. And I don't have to get up to speed. I've already met with Governor Sandoval about what he's putting together. We have a good working relationship. I can hit the ground running. Okay, Commissioner. Yeah, I've got so to like, go ahead. You have a to respond to that. For all that you've done is want to be the education governor, you were the education assemblywoman and were the last in education, were the last in health care. Our mental health CR system is broken. It is a broken system. We need some fresh blood, some new ideas in order to move things forward, similar to what we did at UMC. When I got on the county commission, we were losing 70, 80 million dollars a year, you know that. Last year we profited 20 million dollars because I was part of a group of four. It was a four to three vote to turn the operations of the hospital over to a board that's taken over from there. What that volunteer board has done is turn that hospital around and it's now operating in a profit and all that money is being reinvested back into the hospital. You oppose that because New ideas are something that we need to implement in Clark County. We need to implement the state of Nevada as well. And I appreciate that, but you know what? What made UMC hell was whole was Obamacare. It was the ACA and the new dollars that came into that that actually provided that and the expansion of Medicaid. And I, that that changed 200,000 more Nevadans have access to Medicaid. What we still need to fix is rate the reimbursement rates because our doctors are now not taking it because we're one of the lowest as far as our reimbursement rates. But I have not been in Carson City in, in tw almost 12 years. When I left there, we had funded education, we funded class size, we funded kindergarten, and we made sure the teachers had salaries. That's what I will do once again. That being said, she voted against turning UMC over to a different group of trustees that is now operating at a profit. Whatever the reason might be, whether it was another protest vote or what it might have been, UMC is flourishing under this board that we have now. Our county hospital is the best in the state and I can plan on keeping it that way. I've, I've fought for county hospitals, but you know what? It still comes down to about the money and the money finally came through with the ACA and that's how that, that hospital was able to turn around. Okay, we're gonna Thank move you. on now to school safety. Uh, here we are and now in the wake of yet another school shooting, this time obviously the latest in Texas. Uh, a week ago, 10 dead, and according to PolitiFact, 26 students so far have been killed in 2018, 13 U.S. service members killed in combat zones during that same time. So my question is, why not now as county commissioners and then again as governor if elected, why not divert whatever money is needed right now to increase the number of armed CCSD police officers at schools no matter the cost? Commissioner Sisolak, you begin. I don't think the answer is necessarily putting more guns in the school. Yes, we need to arm our CCSD police officers, but we need to do a lot more when it comes to guns. We need to get to the bottom of what's happened. The Dickey Amendment uh, is get, caused a great deal of problems as it relates to gun violence. Uh, we should have had that eliminated years ago. It wasn't. It wasn't until two months ago that that was finally taken out. We can begin to do some research on the, what's causing gun violence in our schools and in other areas. But my immediate thing I need to do is we need to implement background checks. We need to ban bump stocks, 
ban weaponry, assault rifles, weapons of war, and ban expanded cartridges. We need to keep our schools safe, and we need to work with the school district in order to do that. And to address more on the social media side, there's oftentimes been hints of this violence coming with some of these perpetrators of these crimes. We need to be a little more proactive in terms of trying to identify that. Commissioner June Kiliani, what do you what do you think of that, and where is he wrong? Well, I think that um, Superintendent Skorkowski actually said the bond rollover money can be used for bringing in some additional security pieces, and so that would b include making sure that we have um, officers, which we already have school police officers, but also looking at security, looking at lighting, looking at entryways. How do you do the right kind of fencing? What you don't want to do is make our schools into prisons. So you have to be sensitive because the kids have to go out for band, they have to go out for PE. So you have to make sure that you're looking at that whole facility. More importantly, there is a, a task force that's been put together by the current governor. They are working on school safety all across the state. They finally, finally last week added a teacher to it. They really should have students and parents involved in that plan as well so that they're hearing from the kids about how they in, ingress and egress out of the schools. But it's also about making sure that we have mental health components that are out there. We're not taking care of that for our kids so that they have a, a resource. There's bullying going on in all our schools. You can pass all the anti-bullying legislation as you want, but you have to have the support there to do that. Washoe County um, Board just voted to do, do buy a new system that might go in and be able to look at the license plates and do a background check on them. The problem is, the background checks were not implemented by Adam Laxalt, um, so we, that's a weak system in and of itself for who they're going to be able to capture. So we do need to make sure that we input, uh, put, put into place question one that was voted on by the, the voters, which I supported and I was very um, su uh, outright supportive of it. I worked with Moms Against Guns and a variety of other individuals. But when in 2015, when the legislature under Senator Roberson took away local government's rights to be able to set up their own gun laws, that was a preemption that needs to be overturned. And that took away all of, all of the entire state. What's good for Lincoln County Schools is not necessarily good for here. You have to look at design, so we need to go forward looking at our designs on how we put schools together so that you're designing them for safety purposes, making sure the kids can get in and out, and you don't interfere with fire issues as well. So to me, there, there's some possibilities for funding through the rollover, which is the legislation that I wrote, and they re up just a couple of years ago. But we have an obligation at the state level once we decide what that, that need is full for the entire state to fund it regardless. I've got to add, I'm a single dad with two daughters. When they graduated from Durango High School, I didn't have to worry about gun violence in the school. It just never came to my mind. I worried about other things. I worried about their safety driving to and from school. But gun violence isn't really something that entered my mind. Sandy Hook changed everything. We need to make sure that our kids are safe when they go to school. Whatever that encompasses, I totally support 100%. Well, if you so, believe just in the, in the overall philosophy of having armed trained officers inside schools, why can't the argument be made, well, some is good, more would be better, and why aren't our politicians doing more to put more armed trained officers inside our schools immediately? No one has necessarily said that you needed more armed trained officers. You do definitely need officers that are trained, but you don't want people that are, will escalate a situation, which is part of what was going on in the school district here. Clark County is the only one with uh, police officers. The other um, up in Washoe, they contract that security out. We need to hear from those on the ground what needs to come into play. But more importantly, I don't have an A minus from the NRA. I didn't. 1982, we had a teacher killed, Mr. Piggott, at Valley High School. We've unfortunately had guns and incidences over this period of time. Part of that's what triggered police co to come in, but not all of it. They, we never went back and looked at, we have, um, how, what are the codes that you use in order to signal that there's a problem? We need to make sure that we don't confuse faculty and students by doing fire drills and having the same code for, for a dangerous individual on campus. So they're trying to work through those systems. We need them to be able to tell us what best needs to go on on a campus. But I don't want to arm teachers either. That, that would be just totally un inappropriate. Okay. Well, let, 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 me, let me just ask, let me just interrupt here for a second because there's a couple things that have come up and I, I want, and Pete, voters have heard about these. So let's talk about the A minus. Right. So the message from the June Kiliani campaign is basically, here's Steve Sisolak. He was a conservative Democrat. He was a gun guy until he started running in the Democratic primary. Suddenly that history of being friendly with the NRA is over, and now suddenly you're a progressive. Is that right? No. There was never, and Commissioner June Kiliani, Chris knows better than that. 
there was never any friendly with the NRA, John. There a minus is pretty friendly. Well, A minus isn't friendly. I never took a vote that related to that. I might have filled out a questionnaire 22 years ago. I don't even remember. But I can tell you that I'm an adult. My opinions have changed as things have happened. What happened at Sandy Hook is where this started, and I think a lot of people were a lot more uh, gun friendly 22, 25 years ago, as I might have been. I was on the ground on 1 October. There was no other commissioner that walked through that festival lot on October 2nd with law enforcement like I did. I saw the bodies. I saw the blood. I saw cell phones, heard cell phones ringing with loved ones trying to reach somebody that was at the concert. For someone to have war, weapons of war in their room and expanded cartridges is ridiculous. And to try to make this a new campaign issue, Chris knows that it's not true. She knows where I stand on guns, yet she continues to put out misinformation. So that's unfortunate. That's where it's she's not misinformation, I John. And it's, it's, I stood up to the NRA when I was in Carson City. I stood up when they tried to, with their whole pattern across the United States was preemption laws. We stopped them on that. They then came in and tried to expand the concealed weapon laws. I stood up to the NRA back before any additional shootings have to come into play. We, I don't need to evolve on this. I've, I've been very strong anti, com, or in support of common sense gun reform. We, not only do we need to ban the weapons of war, we need red flag legislation, we need to overturn the preemptions, and we need to make sure that we're doing universal background checks so that we know who these people are, especially if they have a mental health issue. We need to deal with that part of it. Let me ask you a question. No, i got to follow up here, John. All right. Chris keeps, in, she, and she, I know she's a former school teacher from 20 years ago. C is a passing grade with the NRA. She clearly passed when it came to the NRA's questionnaire. Now, I don't know what I did in terms of how the questions were answered, but I can tell you everything that's happened since Sandy Hook has, I've seen things I never wanted to see. I visited a war zone and it's changed things. I want to just wrap up the gun discussion sure. and then so Todd can get into a different subject. But let me, you said something just then that's been said a lot, and I think by both of you. You're, whoever wins this race is going to face Adam Laxalt, the attorney general, uh, in the general election unless a huge upset occurs. You keep saying he didn't implement the background check law. He has no power to implement the background check law. What happened is, as you well know, Commissioner, mm -hmm. is he gave an opinion and the governor uh, was the one who said, okay, we're not going to implement this. You can't put that on Adam Laxall. I think you can because he never said a word about it. He just simply wrote an opinion that, said, that guided the governor into that position. But he couldn't have implemented but it. He you'll, admit, you'll admit that, right? Can't was a swear word in my classroom, John. I'm sorry. And so Adam Laxalt and the governor could have found a way to at least be able to deal with the will of the voters here. And that was a long time ago. And that really looked at domestic violence and mental health issues. We need to keep guns out of those types of individuals' hands until th th that there's preemptions that come into place so that local governments can decide what's best for them. I don't have an A- minus from the NRA. I would never ever have an A minus from the NRA. This is just, it's a plain fact in the long run. I didn't have to evolve. I stood up to the NRA back in the day. I, I'll take on the Trump administration if they think they're going to come into Nevada and try to tell us how to do, deal with our gun laws. We'll wor work across the aisles with individuals, but you're, there's common sense legislation that can come into play. There's even training, helping parents lock up their guns so we don't have another killing like tonight just before I walked in here. Another teen just killed his dad and shot his mom. We need to do something better as society we need to be better as a community that we, we assist people with how do you do this in order to make sure that they have safety within their own homes John I don't disagree with that but I when we face the worst tragedy that this community has ever faced on 1 October and when I got that call at 10 30 at night when the sheriff called me my life changed forever and I did everything I possibly could to help improve this situation get our community back together we put our calls for blood we put our calls for food we started a victims fund that raised 32 million dollars it's not going to save anybody's life, but it's going to help put people back together. I think that we did the right thing at the right time, and I'm proud of what we did. And your campaign logo was on the button for the GoFundMe, but you know what, that, be that as it may, that got changed. None of us were called by the sheriff that night. I did not find out until I woke up that morning, and I'm vice chair of the county commission. We've had to put in some protocols now for notification when something like this happens because staff just left a message on everybody's phones and didn't bother to What do you mean his campaign logo was on the GoFundMe? It, it was on the page when it was first set up. Is that true, Commissioner? I don't know what she's speaking to. What campaign logo? My name? Yeah, your name, your, their current logo that you use right now. My name in a type style. I, I don't know. I can tell you that we started a campaign at 2 o'clock in the morning, and we did everything we possibly could. And to come up with this 
ticky-tack, picky, uni stuff. Everybody was called. I answered the phone at 10.30 at night. I didn't go to voicemail. I picked up the phone, and I did everything I could. That's all I stand for. We did that as a team, as a community. It was a sheriff. It was Aaron Rausch with the FBI. We worked hand in glove for two, three weeks on a daily basis to try to pull this community back together. And I'm proud of that, John. Okay, we're going to move on now to, to the Raiders Stadium. We're going to begin with you, Commissioner June Kiliani. You, of course, have been an outspoken critic of this deal from day one. My question is, uh, as governor, what will you do to try either change or alter this deal? And is your viewpoint short-sighted? Moody's just recently came out indicating this stadium is going to bring in jobs, and it's also going to be an added draw right here to, to Las Vegas. I was never against the stadium. I was against the funding par portion of that. So the public subsidy, it was called the worst public sub subsidized stadium in the United States. And I, I even tried when I went through public testimony to say, if you're going to do this, there's some better ways to do it. The average public tax giveaway is $262 million. They gave $750 million to multimillionaires. And that's when Mr. Adelson was still involved. And then they just left it there for the, the, the Raiders. But more importantly, they don't even pay property tax that you and I and everybody else is paying. And that's money that can go to counties, police, fire, schools. All of that needs to be generated. I appreciate the jobs that are going to be there. I applaud that part. But we're growing back again on the strip. So there's jobs out there now that individuals can take. And they're short term. We have to start planning for the longer term. We also need to make sure, you know what? I'm so proud of the, being from Chicago, I'm so proud of the Golden Knights. I mean, they're just phenomenal. And even the owner of the Golden Knight said, why are we giving $750 million away to the Raiders Stadium? It could have gone to police, fire, and teachers, and they could have been number one. But real, I applaud real, him for a, that position. A, a real quick follow-up, though, but uh, if elected, will you try and, and change this deal or alter a deal? Is there no, anything you can do about it? My understanding in talking to the legal folks is, unfortunately, they wrote that bill in an extremely tight way. Normally with initiatives and things along those lines, you can go in and modify them. But unfortunately, this one, I'm told we can't. They even for the first time ever put in an, a requirement that the commissioners had to vote yes. Not discretionary, had to vote yes. And I voted no. I voted my conscience on that part. I, I'd been out there publicly. I'd gone to the, testify in the meetings. We, you know, it was me, Nevadans for Common Good, Culinary Union, and Taxpayers Association that had concerns about the funding structure of that part and, of it. And, and the taxpayers are still on the hook, Todd. That's okay. the problem. And, and Commissioner Sisolak, I mean, I mean, does she have a point? Is this a $750 no. million dollar public giveaway to the private interests? Wait, there, wait, there's no public giveaway. They don't pay property taxes because they don't own the stadium. The stadium is owned by the county. It's the tenants are going to be UNLV and the Las Vegas Raiders when the Raiders are here. That facility, those two projects that were connected, she voted against a convention center expansion. We're falling behind Orlando, Chicago, and other areas. She voted against the stadium. What does she say to the 40,000 folks that are going to be employed as a result of that, why she voted against them? I don't know, but I can tell you that is paid for by a room tax, a 0.88% uh, for the stadium, 05 for the convention center. Uh, there are 31,000 construction jobs. 13, she's talking about permanent jobs. 13,000 permanent jobs are gonna be created as a result of these two projects. Now the resort community came and was very strongly advocating this for one reason. It's, they have 160,000 rooms to fill on the strip corridor every night, 160,000. This is gonna bring in a lot of new events, not just the Raiders. We're talking about having a Super Bowl here in the next six, seven, eight years. We're talking about potentially bringing in a Final Four for NCAA basketball, rock concerts that we never got before, another bowl game, uh, neutral site football games that are gonna come that are gonna bring people in, that are gonna spend money, and they're gonna stay in their hotel rooms. Those are all positive things. And every one of these dollars that we're talking about is paid for by our tourists as part of our room tax. And what it will do as a result of that facility being there, it's funding education. $13 million per year is going to be spun off from that stadium that will go directly into education, which is a positive thing for our students. So to vote against the jobs, to vote against the funding for education, to vote against the attraction that's being here, I think was irresponsible. Commissioner, your Thank response you. to that? It's a public-private partnership. That was the game that they played in writing up that legislation so they didn't have to pay the property tax. They don't have to pay the live entertainment tax either. So if you're a small bar, bar owner and you have a pianist in there, you're paying the tax, they aren't. 
But the convention authority, I supported that legislation. It's in my district. And in fact, in 2015, it should have been opposed, but uh, su supported and passed, which is when they first had the bill, but Sheldon Adelson killed it. And then they came back and did this roundabout way in order to be able to put this into play. More importantly, the permanent jobs are mostly at the convention authority. And I appreciate that there may be $13 million starting in 2021, maybe going towards ed education, but all that property tax loss is a huge loss. And then my my constituents that live in daily weeklies are paying to subsidize the multimillionaires. But and you, but and you just before. But you can't deny there is a potential, a potential upside here. Absolutely. Right? And I applaud the stadium, but not how it was financed. Where are our priorities? They are out of whack. If you can't, we're the worst funded school system in the United States, and we can't put money there. Tell me, the day of the, the, the um, what the governor was going to call them into session, he had another bill. And that bill was to also raise room tax for schools, because he already knew that there was a shortfall at that point. And my colleague turned around and said he was furious about the money going north and brought that north-south thing, and that got withdrawn, and they did not move that money in. That would be helping us right now with the $68 million shortfall in Clark County and the 30 some odd million dollar shortfall. Where are our priorities? That's all I'm saying. Okay, and Commissioner June Kilani is entitled to her opinion, but not her own facts. You can't make up facts as you go. There have been 17 votes on this stadium since it started. 17 votes. She voted yes 15 times on the stadium. She voted no two times. There have been a total of two negative votes cast on the stadium, both of them cast by Commissioner June Kilani. That's because she just doesn't like a football stadium. It was okay when it was for the Smith Center, and even though she said that it was built with private money, it was not. It was funded through a car rental tax, and I would have probably supported the same thing because the Smith Center is a great uh, asset in our community. But that is paid for the same way, by people that come and rent cars. She advocated a green energy credit that was estimated somewhere between $900 million and $1.5 billion dollars for companies that said they were gonna do it anyway. Yet she advocated to give a rebate for those folks. Why? That money could all have gone for education. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna end it there for now. We have a quick break. Uh, certainly we know a few punches are being pulled from either candidates, as right now those campaign ads circulate on airwaves. Just day. take a look at two ads for one in support of each candidate now they are from outside groups for these campaigns so let's begin with this one showing in support for Chris G about Chris G the truth is Chris G was an educator for 23 years has fought for marriage equality school funding and stood up to the NRA that's a true progressive just days after the one October shooting, Steve Sisolak took thousands of dollars from a machine gun range that markets a weapons experience for children. He's also been called the most conservative Democrat. No wonder the NRA gave him an A minus rating. That's the truth about Steve Sisolak. And so Commissioner Sisolak, is that the truth? Absolutely not. And they know that. I don't know who put up the ad. It was one of the outside groups that have come in to support Commissioner June Kiliani with seven figure media buys. 
Uh, they know fully well where I stand. I probably got, I guess I did, I'll confirm that, a contribution from a parent company that owns a gun range facility. Anyone to question what my motives were or what happened on 1 October should be ashamed of themselves. It's clear that I stepped up when I thought that it was necessary for me to step up, and I did the best job that I possibly could as it relates to that. So, no, the ad is simply not true. Uh, Commissioner June Kiliani, is that ad misleading? No, I don't believe so, but it's not my ad, so I don't know. I, I have no say so over that part of it, but I would say that no matter what, he took money after 10, 10 1. If, and that's the truth, then you have to deal with that part of it. You have to own that part of it because if you're saying that you've evolved on gun reform and then and went through that tragedy there and then turn around and took money from the gun owners for, that marketed to kids that are under 10 and above for machine gun shooting, then I think you have to deal with that part of it. Whatever I might have taken from a company that's involved with the gun range, a legal licensed company, be that in Clark County, I donated multiple times personal that money of my own to the Victims Fund to help as it relates to this tragedy. All right, let's, let's take a look at another ad. This one uh, by another uh, outside group called United for a Better Tomorrow in support of Commissioner Sisolak. It's the picture of a typical politician. Chris June Kiliani voted time and again to give herself a pay raise at taxpayer expense. She voted to let lobbyists give secret meals and gifts to politicians like her, without disclosing those payments to the public. On July 1st, she's up for yet another pay raise, costing taxpayers even more. Tell Chris June Kiliani to stop taking pay raises and perks. What about that, uh, uh, Commissioner June <laughs> Well, the Kiliani? first one they cite there was the annual session bill that we always passed um, for about 10 years. So I'm surprised they only picked that one, and there was no salary increase for me or anybody else. It was just if you worked a longer year, twice a year, you got paid for it. The second one, to my knowledge, is um, dealing with um, Jean Sagerblum's bill, and everything is still reported. No gifts were given, but she didn't want when you and R did its blue and, uh, and silver dinner because every legislator was invited. She wanted to make sure that they didn't have to itemize every single thing, but they're still reporting all of that, so that's a falsehood as well. And the final one was the last bill of the legislature in 2005, of which I did not benefit in any way, shape, or form because I wasn't even there any longer. So you, you, you think it was all right to actually vote for uh, bills that at, could have benefited you as, had you been there. I but believed the, in annual session bills, absolutely. And if you're going to work, you get paid for the days you work. I don't have a problem with that. It's a citizen legislature, John. When I started in 1991, we made $7,800 a year for two years. And when I ended in 2006, we made $7,800 for two years. It's, it, you know, people that come up there, you want a, a broad breadth of individuals to be there as a citizen legislature. They need to be able to make, t maintain their families and not be put at risk for anything. But nobody was gouging anybody in that in any way, shape, or form. That was annual sessions, and you were paid for the days you worked. I don't think anybody in the public would have a problem Did with that. Did you have lobbyists pay for meals for you when you were up there? No, I, I really, I mostly cooked for everybody else. Um, so I don't, I even have to go back to so, my reports. So let's talk about that. But then. fairly Can, rarely. I didn't go out that much. Let's I talk about dinners. this, Commissioner Sislak, because I, you've made, even though that's an outside group, you've talked about this in your campaign mm -hmm. too. So let's talk about the, these, these two issues. That bill about whining and dining and making it seem like she took secret, uh, was able to take secret benefits uh, from lobbyists. That bill was essentially a lobbyist regulation bill that was voted for by almost the entire legislature. What I, was wrong with that bill? I cannot attest to what her motives were in voting for any bill. I can only say this, that when we were on the county commission and some of us proposed taking a pay cut to be in concert with all of our employees, Commissioner June Kiliani voted no. She didn't want to do that because she wanted to continue to get paid at the higher level. But that's not what I'm talking we, we about. I'm asking other, about the we lobbyist thought otherwise bill. As it relates to that. Uh, the, the lobbyist bill. You're, you're making it seem like she, and this is in several of your ads and mail pieces, you are making it seem as if she tried to take, voted for something to get more benefits from law. Is that what you believe? You've called her a career politician because of that. She is a career politician. I don't th I'm not backing away from the fact she's a career politician. Well, but that's not what that bill did is what I'm suggesting. Okay, what I am saying is that if you're going to, advocate for a bill and you want to take people to dinner and you want to take them to lunch and wine them and dine them. I don't know what trips the commissioner took. I don't know what uh, uh, monies were spent on her. It wasn't until the very end of her tenure that it was even reported what was spent. And I think that people in the community deserve transparency 
And fairness is related you know who, to that. You know who voted and for that bill? You know who voted for that bill? Uh, I do not. A, a state senator by the name of Dina Titus, who is is also a career politician and is supporting you. So is Harry Reid. They were in they were in office longer than than Chris June Kiliani was. Are they career politicians? Are they? You're implying cor corruption of some kind. Is it the same thing applied to them? I'm not implying them? corruption. What you choose to take out of it, John, is up to you. I'm saying that we need transparency. We need openness and we need accountability. If people are going to take these gifts, they should report these gifts. If they're going to hire people, they should report that they hire people. That's what I'm saying. And they, transparency and, they are, and accountability. And they are still reported. That was not done away with in Jean's bill. But more importantly, I chaired elections and ethics, and I strengthened most of the elections and ethics bills. I'm the one who dropped the reporting. I could, tried to get to zero, couldn't get there, got to $100. We, I, even when I got on the county, we didn't even make lobbyists register. I passed an ordinance to make sure that all lobbyists have to register and put down what commissioner they're talking to and about what matter. I've always believed in transparency and disclosure. It, you, 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 the more you're out in the open, then the, the less people well, We're talking about ethics here. I'm going to let Todd jump in in just a second because I know he wants to and he's going to kill me if I don't let him. But hang on. Since you're talking about transparency and ethics here, Commissioner Sisolak and others, uh, there was a story in the Reno Gazette Journal talking about payments that you made uh, to your husband, mm -hmm. your late husband, uh, uh, that totaled more than a million dollars, including about a half a million dollars in one in one year. That really looks fishy to people. So you really can't get up on some kind of moral high ground after you. And when you're paying your husband, you're paying yourself. Thank you, John, for asking that or pointing that part out. Um, everybody knew that my husband was one of the best political minds in the state of Nevada. And when you go to run for an office, you want to hire the best person. I did, and Steve did as well in But you could have done it for free. You could have said, Gary, do my campaign for free. But then that you didn't have to pay him. That would have been an in-kind contribution. Then I would have violated the law that way. So that that's, sounds really good for you to you say. You could have disclosed that's not, it. That's not... I disclosed. Every contributor knows who I hired for my campaign. You've known it for the last 28 years that I ran for office. No one has ever questioned his integrity or his, his values. That money was misrepresented because the million dollars over that 10, 12, 15 year was all paid directly to the vendors because we paid Gary a monthly stipend. We did not pay him and he did not take off the top. Just so like people know what you're saying, does. a lot of that money did go to pay for TV ads or, or for mail. Yard pieces. signs, mail. But, yes. but, you, but you still. You, you decided to hire your own husband, yes. in which that money went into your, your coffers, essentially your personal coffers. No, it, it didn't, John. I understand how it looks, and but Gary, no, he was he fenced off. I even had to set up appointments to go in to meet with him in his own office. I signed the same contract that Steve did. I paid him exactly the same way as, I, as he did. And the, the year of 2006, where the bump was, yeah, it's, it was much more than my usual assembly races because I was running against a Democratic incumbent who had millions of dollars in the coffers. And so that campaign was the most expensive I'd ever that, run that was, that, was that, for, that was for County Commission. Okay, I've maybe. got a follow-up, John. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I can follow yes. up here. Uh, to think that anyone believes you had to make an appointment to see your husband is ludicrous. I mean, that's beyond the pale that you have to make an appointment to go see your husband. I, my kids work on my campaign. They've done the commercial for me. They work, they stuff letters, they knock on doors, they make phone calls. I have never paid my children to work on my campaign. They do it because they want to support me in my campaign. The question was, and I know Gary, I knew Gary ran my campaign. Mm -hmm. Gary charged a regular monthly retainer. And we all know Gary charged a percentage on every yard sign, every ballpoint pen, every t-shirt and every hat that he sold. And you paid that commission. It does get commingled. The money becomes fungible once it becomes into your, into your household. And that's the question. It came into Thank the you. household in that same year that you spent half a million dollars paying Gary. You bought a house for $450,000. That's the question. But, but I guess Commissioner Sisolak, to, to be fair, uh, she's right. You hired uh, a Gary, Gary Gray as recently as, 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 as less than 10 years ago. 2008. Thank you, honey. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I guess you're acting like you're Claude Rains in Casablanca here, that you're shocked, shocked that this went on. Everybody knew this was going on. It was written about a long time ago, too. Why are you suddenly Your outraged by it? Your political insiders like yourself, John, might have known that it went on. I don't you, think you knew it went on. I did not know that you, she was paying you, her husband that time of salary. Absolutely you not. You didn't know that I she was paying her husband? Her Campaign and didn't know that she was using it to buy a house. Absolutely did not. I no one don't they donated to me thought I was paying my children or my family because I wasn't. If your family works on your campaign, you should have them. They should volunteer for your campaign, and that's be, what is typical. Let me be very this, clear. My husband we, was a businessman. He had a business license. He was a political consultant. He set up that small business, and he hired students and young adults that actually he trained all the time. Steve knows that. I did not pay him anything differently than he did. 
but to say that I bought my house with that, my mother was moving back to live with us. That's the only reason we li we moved. We stayed in the same neighborhood. I, I, we went from a house built in 52 to a house built in 64. And I loved my mother, but I needed a little bit more space, and that's why. And we took out a loan and had a mortgage just like any other Nevadan. But you're a multimillionaire. Maybe you don't know how mortgages have to work any longer. I know very well how mortgages work, and I've worked hard for what I have. The difference is this, that I paid Gary on a monthly retainer to run the campaign. I did not write a half a million dollars worth of checks to Gary Gray, Gray and Associates. I'd write my monthly check to him. I was not paying him hundreds of thousands of dollars. I would pay suppliers if I bought yard signs, if I bought TV time, if I bought uh, mailing thing. I didn't pay him hundreds of thousands of dollars. I paid him a monthly retainer. So, John, to say that I knew what was going on, I had no idea what was going on. With no disrespect, I have the bills, and I'm happy to show them to you, and we offered them to him. I have Steve's billings and my billings. All of that went to Gray & Associates with the vendors itemized, and then went directly to the vendors. So we paid him Gray & Associates exactly the same way. Okay, we're going to take this time to move on okay. now. We've been asking uh, some of our viewers for their own questions via Facebook, and so we have a couple of them tonight. The first right now is from Lee Yarbrough. Now, she says that there are both, they are both promising teacher raises in smaller classes. Now that sounds good, but how is it gonna be paid for? Dreams are nice, but the reality is that is going to take millions of dollars. Where is the money going to come from? Commissioner Sisolak. The money's gonna come from several areas. First off, I'm in, I've been in our classrooms. Our, if we wanna re, uh, recruit and retain the best teachers, we have to pay them more money. That goes without question. People that say you can fix education without spending more money, simply you can't do. Our educators, and it's not just our teachers, we don't have libraries in every school. We don't have librarians in every school. We don't have enough counselors. There's several things that we could do. First off, there was an initiative petition passed that did tax the room tax. That money was supposed to go for education. But what happened when the, the legislators were there, they put it in with their left hand, they took it right back out with the right hand. It didn't go for teacher raises. That needs to be implemented. The marijuana tax money was promised to go for education. In my district, I've got a lot of seniors that voted for legalized marijuana because they promised them that it would go for education. It did not go for education, and it needs to go to education. What we need to do is take the DSA formulas that exist right now, hold harmless, similar to a methodology that we employed when I was on the Board of Regents. You hold all the school districts harmless, but the new money that's coming in through the top of the formula to fund education should go to where the schools where it's most needed, where they've been underfunded for so many years. That's where we're gonna get the money to pay our teachers more money. We need to treat the old schools like we treat the new schools. If you go out to Henderson or Summerlin or uh, South, uh, South Las Vegas area down by uh, past the Spanish Trail and that entire area, we've got nice new schools. When you get into the urban core, the schools are dilapidated. They don't have enough books. They don't have enough supplies. Our teachers have to buy supplies. That's simply, simply something that we can't <laughs> have. And I think that the other thing we need to do is we've got a lot of people willing to volunteer in the school system. I had a senior, a lady come to me that she wanted to volunteer to tutor math after school, to help kids with their math. But they made them jump through 10 hoops in order to get there and finally she threw up her hand and said, hey look, I just want to volunteer and she backed away. We need to encourage the volunteerism between our senior community and our school. And Commissioner June Kiliani, do you think, uh, would you be willing to raise taxes in order to pay for teachers? In 2009, the voters voted for money to go into education and it did not. It went into the general fund. Some of it wound up in the DSA. But the pot tax that, went, that was um, approved didn't go all into it until the governor kind of did a shuffle with it as did the legislator. So we need to fence those off and make sure that those two pots go directly to schools. The funding formula has been messed up. It, it worked for many 30 plus years, but now it does not recognize the different types of needs of children that we have. So the diversity of the kids, and that's what this is still all about, is making sure that we're funding for, for children. That funding formula, needs, the weighted formula, got started last session. They need to fix that part of it, and then you may not need as much of the categoricals going in, and that, therefore you can distribute the money more equitably across the state. But more importantly, that, you know, the bond rollover that the commissioner is talking about, I wrote that legislation and I worked with Manny Cortez and I worked with gaming in order to make sure that we took the 2% of the room tax at that time, added it to freezing the bonds, and that's what built every school in Clark County and most of the uh, uh, several others around the state. 
the priorities are done through a bond oversight committee and a selection committee. And I don't think they've done a very good job of selecting the older schools that need to be repaired. I've always talked in the, taught in, in the ones that are in the more um, urban area, are more of our po impoverished area, and they should have the same bathrooms, the same lighting, the same everything that they do anyplace else. Uh, but, I know. More po but, but let me finish. Uh, talking about the legislature passed a new law that did background checks on volunteers, and it has been, become too cumbersome. We have to have a balance that's there so you know who's coming in to work with your kids, but make sure that you don't make it such a barrier. But more importantly, we've had an adopt the school program probably for 25, 30 years. Senator Joyce Woodhouse started it, and, and, and that's already in play. We need to stop cobbling together dollars for schools and, and bite the bullet. Can't was a swear word in my classroom. We can find a way. I know how to do the budget. I am already working with uh, Senator Woodhouse and Assemblywoman Carlton on how we put that budget together. So I feel very confident by redirecting those dollars, looking at the categoricals, holding harmless, because that's always been our, our position in the legislature, is you don't hurt the rurals or anybody else as you move into this. But I didn't block money that could have been going into schools for the Raiders Stadium the day of the special session. That money would have been new dollars that could have been used that could help with this funding. But sure, the question but still stands, stands real quick. The question still stands for both we real quick. We did take money from the Smith Center that could have gone for education. The car rental increase tax could have gone for education. The money that was rebated as a result of the green energy tax credits, a billion dollars could have gone for education, but it didn't go for education. You can't just pick and choose. Earlier talked about facts. Um, I think somebody needs to go back and look at my assembly bill um, on green building standards that were created. It went into effect. It was a partial abatement. It was good for two months. Unfortunately, the usual good old boy lobbyists went behind the doors after session was done, changed the regulation, and gave the better tax break to Sheldon Adelson at that time, and then se several of the other um, businesses got, took advantage. But God bless Assemblywoman Kirkpatrick and Debbie, the late Debbie Smith, because they went in and fixed it. So that was a projection of loss if that had gone out in that 10-year roll time that didn't happen okay real quick one word answer from either one of you are, are you guys willing to raise taxes to increase teacher pay I will take a look at making sure that we finish the budget the correctly. I am a budget hawk, so you have to go in. I have to see what Governor Sandoval put together. He said there's another 500 million there. I don't even know where that's coming from. The commerce tax is in place, and I support keeping it there. So until I see the budget, see the crafting, and work with anybody, I can't make a commitment to that one, one way or time. another. You have to really, you have to do your maybe. job. <laughs> you have to do your job. <laughs> Commissioner Sisolak? No, I don't think we need to raise taxes in order to pay teachers more money. Okay. That was a one-word answer. Yeah. Close. Uh, so <laughs> so let me ask you a question, uh, Commissioner Sislak. Uh, it came up this week and caused some consternation among Democrats when you talked about the minimum wage. And you went out of your way to, so, uh, both of you said you want to get up to $15 uh, an hour. But you went out of your way to say that there should be a so-called carve-out right. for tipped employees. In other words, in case people don't know what that means, in other words, tipped employees could make lower than the minimum wage because they get tips. Which, right. uh, you really believe that? No. I was you mistaken. I mistake. I was mistaken when I said that. Uh, it's constitutionally prohibited to have a carve-out for uh, minimum wage. But I am committed to getting minimum wage to $15. I said that. The difference between Commissioner Giuncheliani and myself, we can't get there right away. You have to balance the interests of small business with the employees that are working there. I'm not in support of what's going through the legislature now because that goes to $9.40 in 2021. I believe that's not enough. I think we should start at $10 and go up, say, a dollar a year uh, for the five years to get to $15, or start at $12 and go up 50 cents a year in order to get to $15. I'm fine with that. My first job, I was a caddy on a golf course, carrying two golf bags. I made $3.25 for over four hours worth of work. So I know what it's like to work hard. I'm committed to helping the working people, the dishwasher, the person that's cleaning the rooms that isn't making a live, enough money to live on to get them up to a reasonable wage. I guess what I'd ask you, Commissioner Jun Kiliani, since uh, your, your colleague did what very few politicians do and said, look, he made a mistake, that's not what he meant. Uh, I, I think that you said that you wanted a phase into $15. Yes, did, I did. But, but I, I guess with this whole issue of the, of the tip credit, you know, when Commissioner Sislak was talking about it, uh, whether or not he was mistaken, he was talking about how businesses are worried about this going up this high. Why do you seem to have no uh, sympathy at all for small businesses who are going to have to pay this much higher minimum wage? I have sympathy for all our businesses. I don't want to do any 
anything that harms our working people as, as well, but they need to have a living wage, and you sit down and work with people. In the 90s, when I wrote the minimum wage law that actually increased what we have that, that AFL-CIO then put on the ballot, I worked across the aisles. I worked with the taxpayers. I worked with Senator Townsend, and that's when Randolph and I worked out. Let's, you know what, if you're a good business and you're doing X, in that case, covering health insurance, we wanted to reward that. So that's what allowed for the, the drop back of the dollar. Those are the ways I get things done. I learn to listen, I problem solve, and I figure out how, how do we still get there but do it without doing any harm to individuals. But in the long run, people need to make a living wage because we have too many people living in poverty. They're at the risk of just falling off. They're one paycheck away. We have to sit down and figure out how to tackle this so that we are doing it. But more importantly, we have to look at a whole family. You have child care costs that are out there that we're not dealing with. You have businesses that are doing split shifts that are just inappropriate. It's costing people more money to be able to get to and from work to make minimum wage. We have to be sensitive to looking, how do we structure this state? How do we get kinder and gentler and make sure that everybody succeeds? That's why I want a Nevada that works for everyone and not just the privileged few. You have to make sure that as you move through any legislation, you try to do it where you do no harm and you still get the public policy. Last session, but he started out with $10. Last session, they did pass the $12, at least a $12 increase. So that's less than the Democrats got out, and the governor vetoed that part. But so you know what? I, I, I've been consistent on this. I am the progressive in this race. I've always been the progressive in this race because I've never been afraid to stand up for what I believe in. Okay. Even if people don't but, agree with but my me, question they is know wh where I stand. Why should minimum wage be a livable wage? Isn't that hurting businesses? No, I don't that. think so. It's all on how you craft it, how you give credits for things. You sit down and work through these projects. You can't just stand here in a, in a TV station and say, this is how it's going to happen. That would be ridiculous. But you do have to sit down with those businesses, understand what their model, their business model is. But I think they, m many of them wanted to pay their own. But here's the number one thing. If we don't have a quality education system, we're not going to have anybody for them to hire. So we still got to go okay. back to where we need to I've fix that part. I've got to respond to that. We're back go on ahead. to education here. If, if anyone thinks that an accommodation of a dollar an hour is going to cover health insurance, that's ludicrous. A dollar an hour, $40 a week is not going to cover anybody's health insurance. A small business that has two employees, I talk to these businesses, they might have two or three employees. If you take an immediate jump from $7 to $8 to $15 an hour, that's $600 a week if they have two employees. That's $35,000 a year when you figure in the other taxes associated with that. That's the difference between that mom and pop business being in business and being out of business. So we have to come up with a way to reasonably implement these things so that the business can offset it. You can't turn around in that shop, that little donut shop that's selling donuts, and suddenly charge $45 for a dozen donuts so that we, because this had to be implemented immediately. Well, we, we, we have to be cognizant and aware of how it's going to impact the business and take that into account. We only have about a minute and a half left in, in, in this segment. I want to ask uh, Commissioner June Kiliani something about yeah. what appears to me to be a contradiction. You're, you're running an ad that talks about Steve Sisolak taking money from a developer and then voting uh, for, for, for houses near Red Rock. Uh, the ad seems to imply that they're in Red Rock, but, but ne nevertheless, you are actually quoted as saying, I don't think campaign contributions uh, influence my colleagues vote isn't that a total contradiction not at all it's just pointing out facts uh, but if there's an implication no, there come on no wait a minute two times we had votes on red rock both times he sided with the developers period so it's a fact that he took ten thousand and in this last campaign report he took fifty thousand but why mention zeros. it if you don't think so it influenced him it's more about disclosure and people understanding what where you're coming from i sided with the environment and with the public that were in total opposition to that he decided to side let, with the let developers him no, that's, that's the plain that, fact that, that. that just totally mischaracterizes first off it's in Gypsum Ridge. It's not where you flew your helicopter through where you saw all the Red Rocks and with the table swinging under it. That's not where it was. It's in Gypsum Ridge, which is a 75-year-old gypsum mine. It's near Red Rock. It's a ways from Red Rock. Well, you can see Red Rock from there pretty Not well. from where the mine is, John. And if you but welcome, where you build the houses, you'd be they, able to see Red Rock. You can't see the area where she flew her helicopter. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. The, I'm talking about it is not in the Red Rock Conservation right. Area. You can't develop in the Red Rock Conservation Correct. Area. Commissioner June Kiliani knows that. That land has been raped and ravaged. On the advice of our legal counsel, we took the, he said he could not defend a denial on that situation, which means if he'd have gone to court and we'd have lost, it would have been up to a judge to say, sure, you can build 20,000 homes, 50,000 homes up there. Judge would have total control of that. The attorney specifically said, I cannot defend you denying this, and she denied it anyway. 
Now, that's just a protest vote. That's not getting something done. We have tried to work with the developer. It's going to be down, if it's ever built, which I doubt it will ever build, be built, there will be somewhere near two, 3,000 homes up there. As of today, there is not one home, not one street light, not one stoplight. Nothing has been built up there. Because the uh, county commission took responsible action on the advice of our legal counsel, and ended up uh, in a situation where today where there's right. nothing built there. Yeah, C Commissioner June Kelly, real, real quick, we've got about 20 seconds before we have to go to break. A quick response to that. Sometimes you stand up for what you believe is right, whether you lose or draw. That He was entitled to what his zoning was, nothing more, nothing less. And yes, it is on the edge of Red Rock, and that destabilizes the conservation area. That's why hundreds of people showed up for over off and on for every meeting that I was involved in. In the long run, you either stand with the environmentalists and the public, that's who I stood on the side of. Okay, we'll leave it there. Now, when we come back, final thoughts from our candidates for governor. Stay with us. A career serving the public. My question for you both is we want to know what has been the biggest mistake of your political life? Commissioner June Kiliani. I regret that I was not able to convince people to make the Raiders Stadium bill better, at least for the public. I suggested that we not have general obligation bonds and instead have revenue bonds. That way the Taxpayer is not on the hook 20 or 30 years if the room tax doesn't go down. Right. So that's what I regret. Um, I thought I was able to be passionate enough about if you're going to do this, let's fix some things, and that didn't happen. Okay, Commissioner Sisolak? I don't think I have a biggest mistake. I've made numerous mistakes uh, in my political career. I served 10 years on the Board of Regents and did the best job I always can, I always could. I continue to do the best job. I go to work every single day, and you're not going to get anybody that works harder or more diligently than I do. But, uh, you know, I, I work well with other people, and I don't think that there's one that stands out in my mind. We only have a few minutes left, so try to keep your answers short. We, we've let you go back and forth. Okay. Uh, I'll start with you, Commissioner Sislak, on this. Name one vote you took that went against a major contributor. Uh, the road at uh, Red Rock. What road at Red Rock? The road for Gypsum Ridge. We could have voted to give him 20,000 homes. We did not do that. We voted to approve a concept plan, even though he was a contributor. So I did not support what the developer wanted. Uh, we limited down as far as we possibly could. I gave money back on the Steve Wynn situation who donated money. That wasn't a vote, I guess, but when the okay. uh, news came out about Mr. Wynn, he'd given me $15,000 and I donated it the next day to Shade Tree Shelter. All right, Commissioner Drew Kiliani. Right about that. Name one time you voted against a major contributor. Billy Walters. What was the vote? It was a, a zoning issue and I voted no. Okay, let me ask you another. This is an easy question for a yes or no. Commissioner June Kiliani, would you, as governor, uh, support banning brothels in this state? No. Commissioner Sisolak? I think it's a local decision. All right. All right, real quick, Commissioner Sisolak, please. You guys have gone back and forth. What's the, the best uh, part of Commissioner June Kiliani? What's her best attribute? That she's willing to... You want to ask yes, me about yes, yes. Oh. The best part is that she's willing to run for office. I admire anyone that's willing to step up and enter the political arena as it relates to you know, running for office, putting yourself out there on the line, and, and I commend her for that. Commissioner June Kilani, what's the, what's the best attribute about uh, Commissioner Sisolak? I'd have to say he's a good son and a good dad. He's taking good care of his 91-year-old mom, and that's something that you want to actually appreciate. All right, well, thank you both for your time. Uh, that is all the time we have for tonight's debate. Uh, we know, but I'm being told, actually, we do have an extra minute and 30. 
So scratch that. We have a couple more questions. Go ahead. So uh, I, I guess what I'm wondering is a very simple question. Uh, Commissioner Sisolak, in the event that you lose this, uh, uh, will you campaign vigorously for Commissioner June Kiliani? I will support Commissioner June Kiliani. Will you campaign vigorously for her? I don't know how you define vigorously. I'm campaigning as vigorously as I can mm -hmm. for myself, and I would do everything I could to help her get elected. What about you, Commissioner June Yes, Kiliani? I don't want Adam Lacks out there in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> so you, you, will be out, you will be out there on the stump. I'm a Democrat, John. I, I, I stay with the Democrats in the long run. Uh, let, let me ask you another, uh, we have about a minute left, so make this brief. Commissioner June Kiliani, this has come up recently, criminal justice reform. What about as governor, would you support the abolition of cash bail? <laughs> yeah, our, our DA was recommending that, yes. So you'd support the abolition of cash bail if you were, you, you'd propose that. We definitely, need to, we definitely need to do that. It's uh, adversely affecting minority community as well as charge stacking is affecting minority community. So that has to be. I've worked with uh, Chief Justice Hardesty on that. So I think we are making inroads in that area. All There's right. a lot of social justice issues, as you know, John. Um, I'm working with the Nevadans for Common Good on some we're several. Of, we're of out of time. Well. I'm really sorry. Okay. I appreciate yes. it. Thank Th you. This time we were out of time for real. Thank you both so much for being here. We hope our viewers Thanks. have found this uh, very helpful as you decide who should be the next Democratic candidate for governor. Thank you to both of the candidates this evening. A quick reminder: tomorrow at 6:30, John and I will be back for our second debate as we uh, cover the Democratic candidates for the fourth congressional district.